Hey, welcome to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. I'm John Carismo, and every Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern time, we come to you live to help you understand the technical side of the real estate industry and maybe even apply that to your business so you can take it to the next level, maybe break into a new field. What we're talking about today is land development from start to finish. And we're going to be tying in a lot of the concepts that you might have learned in your pre-licensing course, some of the basics about land development, but kind of building on those a little bit more so you kind of understand what it's like from acquiring this land all the way out to actually selling the buildings that are on top of this land maybe years down the road. So stick with us. I'm John Crismo. We've got a great episode for you today. You're watching Ask the Instructor. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time, I'm John Crismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, so welcome to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. I'm John Crismo, and every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time, we come to you live to help you better understand the technical side of the real estate industry and the real estate industry can get super technical. And what we're talking about today is a topic I'm sure a lot of people are interested in because this is where all of our housing, all of our office buildings, all of our retail plazas, our grocery stores, anything that exists today went through some version of this process it is that we're gonna be talking about um, at some point in time. And if you're interested in purchasing land. A lot of people get into real estate and get their real estate license so they can start to know the real estate industry and get a, a better understanding of the sales process and uh, you just learn as much real estate as they can because ultimately they want to invest in real estate. And investing in real estate takes a lot of money. If you don't have a lot of money to invest in real estate, what better place to learn then an industry, the same exact industry, we were able to make commission checks at 10, 15, 20, maybe even $100,000 of a large enough property that you're selling. So uh, again, this is a hot topic. A lot of uh, people, we get questions about the investment side, the development side, especially in, an, in, an, in a place like the Tampa Bay area, really Florida in general, there's a lot of new development or redevelopment going on. So we're gonna be talking about these different concepts today and um, tying in a bunch of the different words and, and kind of what they mean with all this stuff here, but just giving you an idea of what this process looks like start to finish, with land development. So, bunch of stuff with land development. Before we get into that, if you're interested in starting or enhancing your real estate career, make sure you give us a call or check out the web links below. And also one other disclaimer, this is a live show. So if you guys have questions about any of this stuff here, whatever the question may be, feel free to, to put that out there. You got a comment, a snide remark, whatever it is that you want to do. If you just want to say, hey, what's up, put that in the comments. We've got those loaded up for both Facebook and YouTube here. We'd love to answer your questions or just give you a shout out right here on the show. So let's talk about the this, um, the first steps of land development. So really, if you look at these words here, land development, what do you have first? You have to have land first. You get land first, and you could then develop that land into real estate with some buildings, with some structures on it. But first, it comes back to having that land. So step one, really, acquire land. So first you're going to be acquiring land. And so it depends on the market it is that you're dealing with here. You could be dealing with a market where it's just a lot of, of trees, a lot of farmland. It's pretty rural. These more suburban areas that uh, we have been uh, expanding further and further out to as the years go on, they typically were just at some point in time, either just some sort of rural land, some form of rural land, whether it's farmland or, or just uh, wooded areas and whatnot. So in these types of situations, if you're in a more rural area, so rural areas, you could usually buy large tracts of land. So 
So in a more rural area, some, again, somewhere where it's not very developed and the land is pretty much cheap and there's a lot of land available, you can buy some large tracts of land. Now, when you're looking at purchasing these large tracts of lands in rural areas, you're doing a little bit of speculating um, because typically what's going on when you're buying in these rural areas you could go in this one of two ways. You could buy from somebody who's already been holding this property for some sort of period of time. Maybe they've been holding this property for 10, 15, 20 years, or maybe you want to buy that land now when it's super cheap. Cross your fingers, and, and really, like I said, this is the speculative, the investment side of this year, where you're hoping that this is going to become a popular area. And a lot of market research will talk about some of the things it is you could look at for trying to find this. But I mean, really, that's what I want to focus on with this here, because the easy way of doing this is just paying more money, significantly more money, to purchase this land from somebody who already planned this out years before this area started becoming popular. Because once that property start, that area starts to become popular, that your return on investments and what's possible for or developing in the area, that those returns start shrinking as the area becomes more pop, uh, popular because it's going to cost you more for that land. If you're able to get in here before this is a popular area, before it, it's very populated, popular, populated, see how those words there are the same. So it, buying these large tracts of land, typically what you want to look for is close to some sort of main highway. And I'll give you guys some examples of these. Some of the areas that I've watched developed over the years uh, in the, the Tampa Bay area. I've lived here my entire life, so I've seen Tampa change dramatically, especially a lot of these suburban areas. Uh, I mean, you go five years back, and, and the Wesley Chapel area is nothing like it's like today. Um, so uh, a lot of expansion that's been happening there. But further south, the New Tampa area, where we're headquartered out of here, this was an area that was 20 years ago completely different than what it was like today. Uh, another sprawling popular area right now that's really starting to grow and develop uh, is down south towards Riverview in the uh, Riverview South Shore, the South Hillsborough County type of area there when you go a little bit further south from New Tampa on 275, about 25 minutes south or so. This was an area, again, it was another rural area where uh, yes, it, it was somewhat populated on certain areas and whatnot, but as the areas like Fishhawk Ranch started coming up, that was kind of one of the first pioneering um, big kind of newly developed communities down there uh, that, that of recent um, that, that was years back that they first started breaking ground with that type of stuff. But now it's moving even further south towards the Apollo Beach area and going even, even further south in the, uh, the Hillsborough area where it, it, it's really getting cr pretty crazy down there. Um, and so one of the things that, that I can see both of these areas, they're all close to the highway. If you notice these suburbs that I had just mentioned, so New Tampa, uh, right now from our building, we're less than a mile from I-75, and that cuts right through New Tampa. Main exit right off of there uh, for New Tampa, so that, that's huge. Another thing is Wesley Chapel. So Wesley Chapel has about two exits um, that, that kind of cut through that. It's a little bit taller than um, as far as the way it goes through with uh, compared to New Tampa, but Wesley Chapel has exploded a little bit quicker and it, it's got two main accesses there, and, and it's a, uh, the New Tampa area is a little bit more cut off from the surrounding areas, it, comparatively speaking to the Wesley Chapel, Zephyr Hills, Land Lakes areas. Those are experiencing rapid expansion because they actually have a lot of connections out through that. So it's actually accelerating that growth. So the common denominator, and then also again, going down to South 75 towards like the Riverview area. Uh, again, we're, we're fairly close to the highway. They also have US 301 that cuts right through there, another major thoroughfare. So so, so that's something when you're trying to speculate out for the land of what's going to be maybe worth more down the road, that's something you want to take into account. You don't want to buy a piece of land that doesn't have any main roads or main highways. If you're planning on building some sort of any sort of major development. Now, if you're just buying a small piece of land and maybe planning to sell this off to some sort of home buyer or, or, or somebody who, who's going to build maybe something that isn't exactly related to um, uh, having people around it, then that's maybe not the most important. But for most types of developments, and even when you're selling a home, if it's closer to a populated area, it's going to sell more than it's in when it's in a more rural area. And one of the best gauges for that of, okay, will this area become popular? 
is it close to a highway? Uh, another area that's really kind of experienced a lot of growth uh, close to the Tampa Bay area is Lakeland and, and that whole corridor that's between Tampa and Orlando. So between Tampa and Orlando, you could take I-4 from Tampa to Orlando. And there's a, when you're driving down I-4 to Orlando, there's a lot of just farmland, vacant land. There's, there's a lot of stuff along the highway there, a lot of warehouse types, uh, car dealerships, uh, RV dealerships, that types of things. But there's a lot of area where there's not much going on. But that corridor is connecting Tampa and Orlando. That uh, kind of looking like I-4 there. And what we've got right in the middle is Lakeland. And Lakeland has been definitely experienced some major growth, but that's because the Tampa area as well as the Orlando area have both been experiencing a lot of growth over the years. And there's these ripple effects that are rippling out to the Lakeland area. The ripple effects rippling out to the Wesley Chapel area. The ripple effects rippling down to the Riverview South Hillsborough area. So when you have growth occurring in these major metropolitan areas, that's where there's some potential for, again, when we're talking about the rural areas, because you get further away from these centers of Tampa, of Orlando, of Lakeland, of Riverview, of Wesley Chapel, the further it is you get out from these areas, the, the less developed, the, the more rural it is that we are. But you wanna look where it's still close to those highways where you can see almost the way those highways are intersecting here. You've got uh, I-4 and then you've got I-75. So going further out, that's something to keep in mind. It's something you want to pay attention to. Now, you have to obviously apply this in your market. You can see that I'm very knowledgeable of everything kind of going on, the areas that are popping up, especially when we're looking at this on a larger scale here of the overall growth that's been occurring in the past couple of years. But it, it, when you're trying to speculate, every little piece of data is important. And it's anything, anytime you see that there's some sort of corporation, some company that's moving their headquarters to a certain city, to your city. We've had a lot of headlines about Tampa with that, with different companies that have been relocating their headquarters. That means jobs for the area. And when there's jobs for the area, those people aren't going to live at their office. They're going to, number one, need the office building. That's probably already there. They already have plans to build it if they're already announcing that they're moving there. So the office building, that's probably taken care of already. But the residential area, whether it's apartments, whether it's single family homes, condos, whatever that may be, townhomes, the pe those people, those workers, those thousands of people that they're, that they're shifting into this market are going to need a place to live. So that, that increases the demand, that, that influx of consumers increases the demand for housing. And you're here as a developer to kind of increase the supply of housing. So every little piece of data it is that you could find is important. The best place to start is okay, looking close to highways that kind of run right into major areas. And now it doesn't necessarily always even have to be because the closer it is you get to the highways, this is probably the simplest rule with this year. Typically, the closer it is to the yard or highway, especially when we're in a major urban area like this here, you're, it, it's going to be more expensive for the land. But you go a little bit further out, maybe so here we've got the I-75, and then you know maybe there's uh, some sort of side road that comes off of that. If, if you're maybe a little bit down here and that's cheaper than being here, maybe here it's super expensive because they know that's a major intersection, but you go out here a little bit, it's a little bit cheaper. Hey, especially if you're developing single family homes single family homes are not as valuable right next to the highway so you get a little bit further out where it's a little bit quieter a little bit less traffic but still close to things that's definitely something that can be advantageous for you as an investor developer so we're going to take a quick commercial break here but when we come back we're going to continue talking about this whole kind of development process from start to finish talking about kind of these initial stages here of picking your land uh, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about the urban area so maybe you're doing this on a smaller scale and you want to put some pieces of property together and maybe develop that into maybe a condo tower just build out a, a single home something like that so we're going to talk about the urban areas and how land development affects that but quickly we're going to take a commercial break for about two minutes you guys have questions put those in the comments you're watching 
watching Ask the Instructor. Are you thinking about a career in real estate? Hey, I'm John Chrisman with the Tampa School of Real Estate, and we've helped thousands of people just like you obtain their real estate license. If you're thinking about a career in real estate, give us a call. The phone number is 813-928-0106. Our advisors are standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way they can. Do you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. If you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time, I'm John Carismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, welcome to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. I'm John Chrisman. This show is brought to you by the Tampa School of Real Estate. If you're interested in starting or enhancing your real estate career, make sure you give us a call. Phone number's down below, 813-928-0106, or check out our website, tampaschool.com. That's tampaschool.com. Uh, we've got advisors standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way it is that they can. So let's go ahead now and... and so we talked about the rural areas here. Let's focus now maybe on an urban area or anywhere where you're kind of having to piece together pieces of land. So if we're dealing more with an urban area it is that you're developing, you're, you're gonna basically be looking at, let's draw some streets out here. So let's say there's, uh, these are our lots that we've got here. And uh, let's say, yeah, we're dealing with urban areas now, so we're going to take that out of the equation here. Say we've got another street here. So we've got these different lots here that you see don't necessarily line up, but this could be what it looked like with, with uh, in a more urban area where it's more blocular. Like this, uh, that's the word blocular, look it up on the dictionary.com. Uh, so let's say that, that you're eyeing this space here and you know that this is a prime space. And again, with this, the speculation, the, the more speculative it is that you are, the better the deal it is that you're gonna be able to get. Uh, it, it's gonna be more expensive when you're having to do less speculation and things like this. So what you wanna pay attention to is uh, again, is this an area where there could be some sort of return on investment? Once you've decided that this is a good area it is that you want to invest, basically what you're going to be trying to do is buy up the individual lots that are in this area. And then once you're able to buy up all of these lots, you now have a big piece of real estate it is there. So a couple things if you're looking to do something like this, because this you're, you're really kind of pulling a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff that... Uh, that's causing uh, a, an issue with doing whatever it is that you want with this space. The first thing is just being able to go through and buy up these pieces of land here. And there, there's been all kinds of stories uh, of developers going out and doing exactly this, especially when an area is a hot particular area and, and they want to be able to build something different there. Maybe they're looking to put like, uh, let's say in this case here, this is all zoned as residential, but this is a, a prime, major street here. Let's say this is actually multi-lanes here. Big major street. Let's say this was Dal Mabry. That's a, that's a big kind of major vein that goes through uh, the South Tampa area there. So let's say that you're like, okay, these properties right here, these are very high value as 
And that, that's where we have a term called highest and best use. So highest and best use is absolutely something you want to consider with this. Because highest and best use would say, okay, if this is a very busy street here, that's not the best place for housing to be. This wouldn't be the best place for single family homes. If these are individual lots for single family homes, that's not the best place for this here because that's a very busy street. You get a little bit further off from here, but if this is a super busy street, even going a little bit further in, not the most value you'd be getting as if it were a more secluded area further away from these busy streets. So yes, the rural areas, you do want to be close to this here, but we're talking in an urban area where we've got, uh, again, imagine single family homes on each one of these lots it is that we're picturing in here. So anyone on this block is losing value of their home due to that busy street there. That they call that an external form of depreciation because it's outside of your property lines. But that creates an advantage and an opportunity to you as an investor, as a developer, because if you're able to go through and buy up these pieces of land, what you could do, there's a term called assemblage. So assemblage is taking these lots and putting them together, taking these individual lots. And let's say, you know, maybe we pick up this lot for, let's say uh, 500,000. And this one we pick up for 400,000. And this one, 300,000. And this one, 400,000. And this one, 600,000. And uh, you know, maybe this one, 400,000. And this one we pick up for 200,000. And this one, 500,000 and this one 300,000 and this one 600,000. So we pick up all these properties, we, we pay all these millions of dollars really for all this lands it is that we're acquiring here. And this is obviously you can see it could get very expensive, but when you're in an urban area, it, it's already got development there. So not only is there the expense of acquiring these pieces of property, maybe you're getting a better deal on that than, than comparatively speaking with some of these here, uh, but on top of the cost of the actual land, on top of these land costs, if this is a developed area, an urban market, you're going to have buildings on here. And then you've got to go through and, and demolish and level all of these buildings. So everything must go in order for you to make way for, maybe you're gonna have a, some sort of retail plaza here where you've got a, a major street here, maybe some sort of corner unit. So ultimately what you're doing is combining these all together into a single property. And let's say all together, it cost you, let's just pick an even number here, let's say it cost you $2 million. I have no idea whether that's what those added up to, but let's say it cost us $2 million So we've got $2 million for our cost. And let's say that the value we have now, because we have this huge piece of land, is $3 million. And with enough time and work and money, because that's, it's going to take all three of those to purchase all of those individual properties there, once you have all of that in place, and you've got these all together, now it's a single piece of land, especially in an urban market, in an urban market that's high demand, especially if it's on this busy street and we have this big piece of land that's, that's primed for some sort of development, whether it's a retail plaza, whether it's a, a, a townhouse uh, community or a condo tower, whatever that may be, if you're able to pull this off and put these all together, now what you have to do is keep in mind when you're going into this, okay, what is gonna be that total value of this land once it is that I've picked up all these individual lots. Once I've picked up all these lots, what does that total value come out to be? And this increase that we're getting here, this jump of turning $2 million almost instantly once we have that last slot secured and we have this now as one full piece of land, that jump from $2 million to $3 million or whatever the jump may be, that's called plottage. So assemblage, that's the process of putting these pieces of land together. We're assembling them together. That's why they call that assemblage. Plottage is the additional value it is that we get from the increase. So that, that increase there from two million up to three million there, that's plottage. That's our increase in value due to having this big large lot, which this doesn't always happen. If you're in an urban, uh, a rural area where 
land isn't the problem, where there's plenty of land available, you're not going to experience something like this. This is more so in a high demand, typically a more urban or urbanized type of area. Because even in a suburban type of area, the ones that are closer to the main roads there, that's maybe even possible with some of this type of stuff. So that additional value would have would be called plottage. So now, let's say that uh, in this next step here, really, we're, we're trying to basically lay out, and, and really you're going through all these steps before you actually take any action on this to really make sure that what you're trying to do is really feasible and really possible, and you're ultimately going to be able to um, make a good return on your investment for this. So looking at, at, at this, we want to try to decide what it is that we could use. And if you remember how I laid these out with these individual lots here, we have these individual lots here. So this isn't the biggest piece of land. It was maybe five lots across by two lots deep. So decent sized piece of land. What we can maybe do here is maybe build some sort of retail plaza. So let's say that that's our game plan. Building some sort of retail plaza here. You know, we've got some parking spaces here. Something like that, and you've got uh, some storefronts here. You know, maybe even have somebody that wraps all the way around. Maybe it's some sort of uh, restaurant. They got their little tables and chairs out here. And then, you know, maybe that's one unit, and we go another unit here. So uh, overall, we're combining this into some sort of three unit retail plaza. In theory, I have no idea if this would match up with the size, whatever it's doing. We could maybe even fit a little bit more of uh, units in there, but let's just say for example purposes, that's what we're doing with this. Now what do we have to do to turn this, what was once residential into non-residential, into whatever zoning it is that you're looking to do, whether it's commercial or agricultural or some sort of special purpose, whatever it is that you're trying to do, we have to reclassify this zoning because this was zoned as residential. So what we would apply for would be called a special exception. So with a special exception, what happens is we take this one piece of land, there was once many pieces of land, but is now one piece of land. We take that one piece of land and we're reclassifying this land no longer as residential or we're requesting this reclassification of the land to turn this from residential into whatever it is that our plan is, whether it's a retail plaza or whatever that may be, the zoning that would permit for that. And typically, if you're going before the Zoning Board of Adjustment, because that's who you'd go before with this, it, there, there's a board that overhears. And these, these are special people in the Zoning Board of Adjustment. This isn't your regular local planning commission. These are people that are overseeing it. And this may vary based on the jurisdiction it is that you're in, but they're basically taking a look of what it is that you're proposing and ultimately approving it or denying it. And so there's another story of this going on on a very large scale that you might have heard about in the Tampa Bay area. And that's what's going on in the Channel Side Water Street area, what was once Channel Side that they're now renaming to Water Street. So they're doing this on a much larger scale. Here we took a block of homes. They're, they've got, I think, 40 acres of land in Channel Side, in downtown Tampa. So that, that's a huge piece of land in an urban area, billions of dollars of investment that they have going in that. But they're using these same concepts for what it is that they're doing there. So we'll talk about that after this quick commercial break. We'll be back in less than two minutes. I'm John Chrisma, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Are you thinking about a career in real estate? Hey, I'm John Chrisma with the Tampa School of Real Estate, and we've helped thousands of people just like you obtain their real estate license. If you're thinking about a career in real estate, give us a call. The phone number is 813-928-0106. Our advisors are standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way they can. Do you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Hey, 
If you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time. I'm John Crismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, I'm John Crismo. Welcome back to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. What we're talking about today is land development from start to finish. Uh, and we've been talking about it in a lot of different ways. We started off talking about rural areas and kind of what that looks like, you're usually buying larger tracts of land. And with that, you're usually speculating further into the future of, uh, of kind of what it is that this area might look like 10, 15, 20 years from now, especially if you want to pick the property up cheap. Then we talked about the urban area and how you could maybe be basically buying up these little pieces of land and putting them together. That's assemblage. You're determining the highest and best use of this particular piece of land. Okay, you see all this land here next to the highway. It's not the best, uh, highest and best use as a single family home. A retail plaza would give a lot higher return on investment. So that's one of your checks that you tech, uh, find out there. The plottage, that's the added value it is you get just from putting these pieces of land together. So maybe you're not doing this whole process from start to finish. Maybe it's you're just buying up these pieces of land, putting it together as a piece of land because you know that that's going to be a valuable piece of land and it'll sell quickly at a higher price than you're able to purchase the land for. You could do that, and then that. In the, the example we're using here, we said, okay, the price of all these once we have them put together is two million dollars, and then it's worth three million dollars. So that extra million there, that's called plottage. That's the added value it is that we get from the added value that we get from the. Uh, putting the, these lots together. So that's plottage, that's the additional value. And then overall, we're taking this whole piece of land and then reclassifying it. And even if you're the developer or, or the investor that's trying to sell it to a developer, you're probably gonna wanna reclassify that land before you try to sell it because that's probably gonna be making it worth more because it's one less thing the developer has to do. Yes, it's probably gonna cost you some money to get that rezoned and reclassified through the special exception, but ultimately that should give you higher return on investment as well. Now, like I was saying, we've been experiencing this in a large scale in the downtown Tampa area. There's a lot of this going on, this whole type of thing uh, around the Emily Arena. The, the owner of the Lightning, Jeff Vinnick, has basically been purchasing up over the years. Uh, he now owns it. It's like 40 acres of land, which 40 acres, that's huge. That's a lot of land uh, all around the Emily Arena. Uh, not just him, him and all of his investors, which include Bill Gates and all kinds of major uh, multinational investors. So there's a lot of money influxing to the Tampa Bay area. And right now they're just in these beginning stages of it. Just uh, maybe about a month or two ago is when they kind of came up with their new name of this community because they're completely rebranding it, completely reshaping it. They're redoing the layouts for the streets, all the streets that they have running through there now. They're not designed for what their master plan ultimately is going to be. The land that's uh, that they're redeveloping, there's, there's a lot of it that's just parking lots that they've just been using for um, lightning games and things like that, which could very easily be changed into a taller parking garage and that fixes that problem where you don't need all this actual flat surface parking for that. So um, that consolidates that and makes that available. Uh, a lot of this stuff might be uh, that there's one with uh, how they're rerunning a road and there's a flour mill, I believe it is, that, that's right there uh, close to the uh, the water there. And uh, rerouting this road across these train tracks is kind of causing a big issue with that. So this will be, uh, especially when you're doing something on this large of a scale, but even on a smaller scale, you're going to run into obstacles and little road bumps and hiccups along the way with this. Here. The key thing with it is to keep your head down and continue to, to push forward and overall searching for that plan of what it is that you want to do with this piece of property. So that's what they're doing right now. And like I said, they're still in the early stages of this. They're, they're slowly kind of releasing all these plans of what they plan on this looking like 2020 is supposed to be a big year where there's a lot of change going on down there. And there, there's a lot of this change will be actually even finalized by that point where there's even new structures that are coming in with that. But what that's causing, if you go back to the beginning here, again, understanding this and, and realizing all how all this has ripple effects onto each other is development like that going on, that's making the Tampa Bay area more attractive to, to companies. And that, that's a, another driver of what uh, a lot of these companies might be relocating their residents down there. And so maybe in that piece of land, rather than a retail plaza, maybe your highest and best use study says, okay, there's a lot of retail around here. So I don't think another retail would be great, but there's not really any sort of, uh, of condo unit uh, or, or whatever it is that uh, you're looking, condo unit, apartment unit, or whatever that may be. There's a lack of condos or a lack of apartments for the demand 
demand it is that exists for those. So that's all stuff you have to consider when you're deciding what it is that you want to basically structure this land for. So you want to keep that in mind as well. Now, let's say you're, you're going across more of these, uh, these long-term strategies here. These long-term strategies where you're buying way in advance. You're buying this land way in advance. Uh, and uh, this is probably going to be more applicable for the rural types of markets where it, it, there's not uh, a lot of... Uh, of population in this area. But what you'll see, and I've watched a lot of this happen uh, throughout the uh, Tampa Bay area. Um, Wesley Chapel is a great example of that. So one of the particular examples, if you're familiar with the area, is the new outlet mall that they had just uh, actually um, opened maybe about a year ago or so was it that they opened this outlet mall it's been rapidly expanding lots of new businesses opening up all around it from costco's to every kind of restaurant to every chain restaurant that is you can imagine is in that area now but going back probably three or four years i can remember driving down i-75 and looking over there to to where this outlet mall stands today and you can see the outlet mall from the highway there that's prime placement on their part with that. So everyone going down the highway, they see that uh, on their way, beating all the people traveling south to the one uh, that they'll see later down in Ellington. But before that, three or four years ago, this, would, this just looked like a horse pasture. And why do I say horse pasture? Because I saw horses out there, you know, roaming in this pasture. And I don't think they were wild horses. I mean, they're always there, unless that was just their turf, their territory. I don't know if that's how horses are, but you'd always see these horses there. So one of the loopholes in Florida law that, that gets exploited quite a bit, um, especially for purposes such as this. So let's talk about what the, the purpose of this law is. It's called the Greenbelt Law. So the Greenbelt Law is basically, if we think of this word in green belt, almost like uh, you might have heard uh, maybe in your geography classes back in school, they're talking about all these different belts, the sun belt, the, the wheat belt, all the gold belt, all these types of things. The, the green belt law is created to protect farmers. You can kind of see how that come, kind of ties together their green farmers, green belt farmers. So this is meant to protect farmers. And it's protecting them from what? It's protecting it from highest and best use. So it's protecting farmers from highest and best use. So that's called the Greenbelt Law. So Greenbelt Law protecting farmers from highest and best use. And this was designed, so let's say we have a, um, some sort of major thoroughfare highway here where, again, best usage for the land adjacent to this highway is maybe some sort of retail, uh, an office building, something where the, the access to the road I is very important. If there's some sort of farm here, if that's farmland, they're not going to classify for tax purposes that the highest and best use of this property would be whatever that highest and best use may be. They'll classify it as agricultural property. So if it is, the term they use is bona fide. The wording bona fide means real. If it's bona fide, or at least seems to be real is what I'm going to tell you about in a second here, as long as it's bona fide agricultural property, that this property is being used for agricultural purposes, it's protected from highest and best use taxation. So this is one of the ways that investors now exploit this law basically. And you know, it's almost a win-win because uh, what they'll usually do is, is lease the land out to some sort of, of farmer. Maybe that was a horse farmer that they were leasing this land to. So the, the farmer has a place to kind of keep their horses or their cattle. A lot of these places, again, when you're seeing these, these cattle along like the highways and things like that, maybe it, it, it's a, an actual farm owned by actual farmers, or maybe, you know, maybe this is just a, uh, to, meant to look like a farm. Maybe this is just uh, uh, a, uh, a fake farm. Real animals, because th th there's all kinds of checks and balances they have to go through to prove that this is actual agricultural land, so they're protected from that highest and best use. But now the benefit for you is if your plan is to open up a outlet mall or a retail plaza or build a new home community or whatever that may be that you're planning to do with this piece of land, if you're not planning to do any of that stuff from 15 to 20 years from now, because you know it's going to take 15 to 20 years for that area to become popular, 
or maybe it comes popular beforehand. Yeah, I don't know, maybe just do a five-year lease and just renew it every five years so that we could kind of gauge once it's popular. Okay, let's get you out of here because you know we, it's time for us to start developing this land. So with all of that said, um, again, that, that's it's an advantage and it's not gonna be the sole thing that makes your investment in this piece of land that you're looking to develop or sell to a developer. It's not gonna be the sole thing that makes you money on this here. If you're counting on that to be the one thing that does make you money, that, that, that's, it's, it's too risky of an investment. But if that helps save you money and make your return on investments greater, then that's absolutely worth it. So that's the Greenbelt Law. And that's definitely, like I said, something that gets utilized when we're dealing with highest and best use and property. So let's talk about some of these processes now. Let's say for, let's say you've got a piece of land and you're looking to develop this into housing. Let's say you've got maybe, let's say you bought 160 acres of land. So let's say you bought 160 acres of land and you want to develop this. You're ready to develop it. It's time to develop it. Or maybe you're just planning for the future about developing it. But you've got this 160 acres. And one way or another, either today or tomorrow, you're going to be developing that into a housing subdivision. So if we're planning out this community here, a lot of things you have to keep in mind. So we've got 160 acres, a huge piece of land here. What you're going to have to have within this land and you have some sort of main entrance. Maybe you have a little uh, gate there at the main entrance. Then you have maybe your streets that go out, kind of, you know, like little cul-de-sac type of deals. However it is that you're structuring it out for all that. I just imagine that's, uh, that's our streets there. But what, what ultimately the point I'm trying to make here is, okay, you bought 160 acres, but you're not gonna be able to fit 160 acres worth of lots in there. The reason why is because you have these streets. Streets, you'll have the, the guard station for the gate or maybe a clubhouse or a pool or a, a gym, any of these common element uh, amenity types of things of the community. You might have uh, some sort of park there, whatever that may be. So you'd purchase 160 acres, you're like I said, maybe you're figuring in um, with all these streets and whatnot, let's say that you're figuring 30% of the land for streets and et cetera, any of those other things that we can't put lots on, anything that's unusable basically, that's what that 30% is representing there. What's not usable out of that entire community. And then what you also need to know is the minimum lot size. And let's say the minimum lot size is 12,000 square feet. So every lot must be at least 12,000 square feet. So again, we've got 160 acres, 30% is what we can't use. We'll just call that unusable, make that a little bit more clear here. That's our streets, our open spaces, our parks. retention ponds, that type of thing. So every lot in there must be at least 12,000 square feet, 30% of those 160 acres we can't use. And now we're trying to find out how many lots we could fit in here. So we're gonna go ahead and solve this one, but before we do that, we're gonna take a quick commercial break. We'll be back in about two minutes, but when we come back, we're gonna be solving this question here of figuring, okay, how many lots can we fit into this 160 acres we purchase here when 30% is unusable, 12,000 square foot is our minimum lot size. So we'll be right back after this commercial break. Stick with us, I'm John Carismo. You're watching Ask the Instructor. Are you thinking about a career in real estate? Hey, I'm John Carismo with the Tampa School of Real Estate and we've helped thousands of people just like you obtain their real estate license. If you're thinking about a career in real estate, give us a call. The phone number is 813-928-0106. Our advisors are standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way they can. Do you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. 
Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. If you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time, I'm John Crismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, welcome to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. I'm John Crispin. This show is brought to you by the Tampa School of Real Estate. If you're thinking about starting or enhancing your real estate career, make sure you give us a call. Phone number is 813-928-0106. You also check us out online at tampaschool.com. You see all those links right down in this little uh, fun thing below. Now, before we get into this question, got a couple of questions. Uh, I was uh, didn't see the uh, the chat messages coming in here. So, uh, Deshana, yes, I am a Floridian. I'm born and raised in Tampa. Um, lived here my whole life life. Uh, what's up, Georgia? Thanks for tuning in today. And then also, uh, Sean, again, who determines the minimum lot size? So this minimum lot size, this is decided by the local planning commission, typically, or whatever local government is basically in charge of creating these zoning ordinances. So for that minimum lot size, that's going to be established by the government, some form of the government, depending how high up it is, depends on the local area it is that you're in. But the government basically is saying, okay, every lot has to be at least this large. Now, you might be in an area that doesn't have a minimum lot size for this, but most areas do, especially if it's a place that is being actively developed. Um, a lot of these master plan communities, they'll have this. And what has to happen with this is we would basically lay out what this is going to look like with all of our, our lots that we are, are gonna develop in our neighborhood here we would basically lay that all out on uh, what's called a subdivision plat map and we would submit that plat map to our local planning commission and then one of the things that they're looking for on there to make sure before they approve this is does it meet the minimum lot size and so this is why it's important as a developer to understand this calculation here because what you're trying to figure out is, okay, how many lots can I fit in there? And then you could use that to determine, okay, I could sell these lots in this area for probably about X amount of dollars, how much return on investment it is that I can expect for this particular property. So let's go ahead and go about solving this here. So we've got our 160 acres. We've got 30% is unusable. We've got a 12,000 minimum uh, square footage for each lot. So what we have to do first, because this is in square feet and then this is in acres, we're dealing with different terms here. So we have to turn that into the same unit. And in order to turn acres into square feet, we've got 160 acres. And we're going to go ahead and multiply that by the magic number of 43,560. 43,560, that's the uh, four ladies going 35 and a 60, or four and three is seven, five and six is 11. Whatever it is that you use to remember 43,560, that's definitely important. Uh, not just a good thing to know, uh, but also for your real estate exam. If you're using these videos to study for your real estate exam, this is a very likely question you could see on your real estate exam and this 43,560 number, that's probably going to show up in your exam one way or another. So make sure you've got that down. But basically what we're doing here, uh, again, is figuring out how many square feet it is that we're dealing with here. So let's take the 160 acres, multiply by 43,560, and we get 6,969,600 square feet. So that's how many square feet it is that we have to develop here. Now every lot has to be at least 12,000 square feet, but can we put lots on all 160 acres? The answer is no, we have 30% that's gonna be for our streets, open green spaces, things like that. So what we need to do now, and if you imagine this kind of like as a pie chart, 
Imagine it as a pie chart. So if we have 30% that's unusable, that leaves us with 70% that is usable. Both of them add to 100, 70, 30. 100%, so whatever's left over is what we have that's usable. 70% usable for developing lots, 30% unusable. So what we're gonna do is take this 6,969,600 number and multiply it by 0.7, or 70%, and we're gonna get 4,878,720 that's usable. So let's put that up here so we've got some more space to work with. 4,878,000. 720 usable square feet. So now that we have our usable square feet, we could go ahead and just take that number and divide it by 12,000. Because every lot must be at least 12,000 square feet. We've got 4,878,720 feet overall usable. So we're just going to go ahead and divide that, figure out how many 12,000 we could fit in there. And we get an answer of 406.56. So 406.56 numbers turned out just like I wanted them to here because a very important thing to remember with this, with this 406.56, or anytime you have any sort of decimal for a number of lots. So with our number of lots, again, our minimum lot size is 12,000. This says we could have 406 12,000 square foot lots and then one lot that's uh, maybe about 6,500 square feet or so. Well, that 6,500 square foot lot isn't going to work. That's not, if you submit that with a 6,500 square foot lot on there that you're planning to put a house on, you're going to get rejected because you don't meet the minimum lot size. It's not meeting that minimum square footage. So even though we're close here, even if this number was, let's say if it was, even though this was the math didn't come out this way, even if it was 0.99, we're still going to just drop that off completely. You round down always to the next whole number because you can't have any fraction of a lot. Even if it was 406.9999999, you'd still be short of the 12,000. Once you hit 407, that's when you have enough for another 12,000 square foot lot. But any decimal here, you just drop off the decimals completely at this point because you can't have any fraction of a lot. So 406 would be our answer for this one. We'd be able to put 406 lots in this community here. And now let's say that, uh, let's throw another piece of math at this here. If we're trying to figure out our profitability we could have on this. So we've got the 406 lots here. Let's say that uh, we bought these 160 acres, let's say, for $1 million. So our cost of them was $1 million. It's going to cost us another $1 million, let's say, to develop. And our development costs, these are going to be things like uh, maybe getting rid of the trees that are in the area or, or uh, we're paying our engineers to generate these maps and do all the figures that, and all the different costs it is before you actually start building out this neighborhood. That's going to be your development cost. So let's say our development cost is going to be about a million dollars as well. So we've got these two different costs here. And we could basically figure out, okay, what our break-even point is. Basically, our total cost that we have in here is $2 million. So that's our total cost. But do we want to just break even? No, what's the point of all this work if we're just going to break even? We want to make a profit, a certain percentage of profit. Let's say we want a 20% profit. If we want a 20% profit, we just multiply this by 20%. 20% of 2 million is 400,000. So we'd have 2,400,000 dollars which would be our minimum selling price plus our 20 percent profit so if we got 406 lots that we need to recoup two million four hundred thousand dollars for now the question comes up of okay what do we have to sell each lot for in order to get our two million four hundred thousand dollars so what we're going to do for this year is take our two million four hundred thousand dollars and go ahead and divide this by 406. And we got about $5,911. And about 33 cents. We'll just round that up to 5,912. So we make sure we recruit that. 
But yeah, five thousand nine hundred and twelve dollars. If we sell every lot for five thousand nine hundred and twelve dollars, we will make back our cost for our land, make back our development cost, as well as get our twenty percent profit. It is that they are looking for that we were looking for in this situation. So that gives you an idea of okay, can we sell these lots for about six thousand dollars? Most markets, you typically can, uh, unless we're dealing with very small lots here. But twelve thousand square feet, that's a decent sized uh, lot, uh, almost a uh, quarter acre there at uh, 12,000 square feet. So that's a good sized lot for six grand. We could probably sell it for more than that. Maybe on top of that, we're, we've got licensed sales associates that we kind of pay them maybe $4,000 for every lot it is that they sell. Um, and if we're doing that, then we could sell these lots for 10,000. Is that still feasible? Is that still something we could do? These are the questions you ask based on your market. And if it is, okay, it looks like we've got a plan here. If these are accurate numbers, if our plan is accurate, if we've gone through and we've checked this and we've built in some buffer for the unknown, the unexpected, figuring a 20% profit, if that's the profit that we need, that's probably not the number you wanna use. You wanna use the profit it is that you want in this scenario. So when you use the profit it is that you want, if you want a 20%, but if you still get 10%, you'll still be good because it's still over and above your cost, then that, that then, then you're good because you will have these unexpected costs and, and unknown elements that'll pop up that'll end up costing more money with this here. So that's our land development kind of in a nutshell. Uh, we kind of talked about everything from actually developing out this land to coming up with a subdivision plat map to how it is that we're acquiring this land and putting it up together. Maybe we're holding it for the long term and we've got uh, some property tax savings we're trying to achieve through the Greenbelt Law, even though that's primarily designed for farmers. Um, and We've done all the calculations to, to see if, okay, is this gonna be profitable? How much do we have to sell these lots for? And so on and so forth. So this is, this is the tip of the iceberg with development. It's a pretty good overview from the, this, uh, from start to finish. Uh, you know, maybe in this uh, neighborhood here, you're gonna build some uh, model homes in these first couple ones. So you gotta factor in those costs as well. A lot of planning to be done when you're trying to develop an area like this. Even, even a neighborhood that's, uh, that's 160 acres, even if it's just one acre or, or that little, uh, let's say maybe that was a half acre with that first example we did where we're trying to do the retail plaza. Each one of these is gonna take some careful research and, and some careful planning. But this whole kind of start to finish that we've gotten here to now that we're ready to start putting homes in, this is a good overview of some of the things it is you have to keep in mind. It's no, by no means all inclusive of all the information we're developing out there. So if you're interested in this, I challenge you to look into it further and find out what else it is that uh, you would need to know, get a little bit deeper in this, find out a little bit more about the zoning ordinances that might require that minimum lot size or, or what the, the rules are even for your area or maybe trying to pick out some areas that could be hot neighborhoods, stuff like that, because this is definitely exciting stuff and there's a lot of money to be made with this because everyone needs some place to live. Whether they're buying that place to live or renting that place to live, as long as we keep getting more people on this planet, we're gonna need more places to live. So uh, fun, exciting stuff today uh, in this land development with a lot of potential out there. And, and like I said, uh, the reason why I wanted to touch on this today, um, we, we based the show of Ask the Instructor uh, about the, uh, the questions it is that we receive, whether it's students enrolled in our online course or students we have in our actual live in-person classes throughout the Tampa Bay area. When we get these questions and we want to go a little bit deeper in some of this information, maybe tie some of the stuff together in a way that's a little bit more in-depth than, than what you're learning in your pre-licensing course because we do talk about development and we talked a lot of things a lot of the stuff i mentioned the plat map the the uh the plottage the assemblage the highest and best use the green belt law these are all things we're pulling in that are all covered in your pre-licensing course here but even today it was as much as we're at the tip of the iceberg this is still uh, uh, a lot more than what we would cover typically in land development. So we do these shows every Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern time to help you understand this technical side of the real estate industry. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you subscribe, make sure you like the Facebook page. If you're watching on Facebook, feel free to share this with any of your friends or family, whether a realtor or real estate investor or whatever it may be. A lot of this stuff is applicable even in other states, especially what we talked about today. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for watching. We're gonna be back next week at 12 noon Eastern time next Wednesday for another episode of Ask the Instructor and also catch us on Friday at 12 noon Eastern time for State of Real Estate where we talk about growing and masterminding your real estate business. That's all I've got for you guys today. 
Thanks for tuning in. Hope to see you on next week's broadcast. But until then, go out there and learn something about real estate. Are you thinking about a career in real estate? Hey, I'm John Crisma with the Tampa School of Real Estate, and we've helped thousands of people just like you obtain their real estate license. If you're thinking about a career in real estate, give us a call. The phone number is 813-928-0106. Our advisors are standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way they can. Do you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. If you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. I'm John Carismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor.